It's a pleasure to be here. It is great to be back at Northern. It's been a while uh, since I was here, followed the story since before it began, um, probably, uh, uh, from the, back in the olden days, deep in the last millennium. Um, but uh, it's a joy to be able to be here today. Uh, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, in the name of the one who is, who was, and who is to come, I greet you. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. I think we've got a majority here today. I'm not sure which is which uh, at all. So beauty is the, is the kind of um, subplot of what I'll be talking about today, although we're also going to land a little bit on some of the ways and practices of Churches of Christ. Uh, David just felt it was a good thing to reconnect with some of our um, DNA, uh, and so we're going to emerge out of this text from Colossians 1 and play a little bit in the, in the farmyard of Churches of Christ um, DNA as well, uh, which I'm learning a little bit about over the journey. Uh, the Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was something of a, f- a philosopher, and I don't think in the end was a person of faith at all, but nevertheless said, never lose the opportunity of seeing anything beautiful, for beauty is God's handwriting. Beauty is God's handwriting. John Piper, uh, a theologian more from a particular right perspective, right wing per- no, right perspective, right wing perspective, nevertheless has some wonderful quotes, and this is one of them: "God created the world to put His beauty on display." And quoting from the psalm, "The heavens proclaim the glory of God." My wife Amanda and I have had the privilege to do a little bit of travel, and in fact, we're just beginning to plan maybe uh, a little bit next year as well. Uh, but we had a little discipline, a discipline there for a few years, for, where every couple of years we'd we'd do some travel, uh, and and other experiences of life have also caused us to um, to go to different places. And so we're just going to have a little bit of a travel log this morning because we're admiring God's beauty and the wonder of God and how it's His handwriting. And uh, of course, uh, up in the centre uh, is uh, Ayers Rock, and that is just breathtaking if some of you have been there the next slide will take us um, actually into the French Alps that's uh, and looking across there um, uh, to um, Mont Blanc yeah Um, just gorgeous facility gorgeous scenery the next slide will take us actually up into Scotland in Cameron country can I say uh, around near Fort William that's Ben Nevis uh, out out our window this slide takes us uh, now to The Grand Canyon, some of you have been here. Again, that's one of those places that just takes your breath away. God's handwriting, unbelievable. The next one will take us, give a little bumblebee. I love the way that God's world has these huge things and yet these small things are all about God. The next slide, again, just the uncurling down in the Otways, actually. The uncurling, the embryo, if you like, of a fern. The beginning of something wonderful. I love ferns. Next slide. I mean, look at little Joey there. Come on. Uh, that was out the back, at the, up in the Grampians Halls Gap. We were staying a couple of years ago and uh, looked out the back window and here is this little dude just checking us out. How good's that? Don't, we, don't you love Australian animals? They are just fantastic. God's sense of humour. Uh, that's um, some beautiful autumn leaves up at Mount Beauty, I think, earlier this year uh, as the seasons were changing. The next slide will take us um, into another place, a butterfly. Our little 22, uh, nearly, nearly two-year-old grandson just loves butterflies. Been to the butterfly place in the, in the zoo and he just loves butterflies. They're gorgeous. Uh, there is a sunrise looking at our window down at Wilson's, uh, just um, north of Wilson's Prom, but in a place we were staying. Just a beautiful sight in the, in the, in the morning. The next one will take us, uh, there's the ferns that I said I loved. I had to put them in. The next one uh, will take us, Australia, the, the colour of gum trees, the uh, gorgeous tones of tan and cream uh, amongst the ferns. And the next slide, we'll land at Jordan Pond, which is up in uh, Acadia National Park in, uh, in Maine, in, in northeast uh, United States. A gorgeous and, as you can see, a peaceful, beautiful place. Um, yeah, well, technology is always fun, isn't it? It turns itself off sometimes. Uh, someone else might have noticed that as well. <laughs> I noted your comment about the printer doesn't work. Um, And so to quote Piper again, in the old creation, we see the beauty of God in the heavens and the earth. In the new creation, we see the beauty of God in the face of Jesus. 
in the face of Jesus. Notwithstanding the prophetic words of Isaiah, who uh, said there's nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. Nevertheless, there is an amazing beauty uh, in the actions and in the activities of Jesus, an inner spiritual beauty. It's not a beauty that's found merely in outer garments, uh, not only in physical appearance, but there's uh, something deeper than that, something that's an internal gorgeous beauty um, that actually shines out of the life uh, of Jesus. And, and it's a real challenge to the current selfie culture where everything's all about me, you know, and the outside look of wherever I might be standing at the Grand Canyon. There were people there with their iPads taking photos of themselves. Amazing. But this picture of Jesus' beauty stands squarely at challenges, um, that current uh, selfie culture that we have. Uh, there's no question. In theological terms, the first or the old creation uh, is an example of what is described by theologians as general revelation. God's revealing himself generally uh, to anybody and to everybody. The second or the new creation uh, is an example of special revelation. Uh, a, a, if you like, a, a supernatural manifestation of God, uh, in this case, miraculously putting on human clothes and becoming one of us, Jesus. The first uh, creation produces information and the second creation produces transformation. It generates transformation. So Jesus became man to make the beauty of God visible as never before. Again, John Piper. Jesus became man to make the beauty of God visible as never before. Or as uh, John the Gospel writer puts it, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the night. It's one of the reasons why I love the text that we just had read to us earlier and we're going to spend a little bit of time in um, today. Uh, and, and six words that I'd like to draw out of, uh, of that particular text in Colossians 1. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's about Jesus and it's about this inner beauty and wonder and, uh, and majesty uh, that we see in Jesus. And so the six words, uh, the first word uh, is the word see. see. Uh, we look at this sun and see the God who cannot be st- We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything. Everything that was created. Here's that special revelation. You want to know more about God? Look at the Jesus narrative. If you want to know God, spend time with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Looking for purpose and a reason to live? Learn the way of Jesus, summarized uh, as selfless and sacrificial love for other people. And back in the day, in the context of, of Paul writing this letter to his friends in the church at Colossae, back in that day, where images of Caesar, who sometimes described himself as son of God, small s, small g, but nevertheless, as son of God, as well as all of the Greek cultic uh, images that were there in Colossae as well, everywhere around him. This idea of seeing of God becoming human in Jesus is a radical and subversive con- concept and idea. And so it is today as well. And so the second word is start. Start. For everything, absolutely everything, Above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. Yes, even the throne of Caesar and his powerful system defended and uh, legitimized by the full array of oppressive structures are subject to the one true king made visible in Jesus of Nazareth. And in our world, so much for Donald Trump and so much for Vladimir Putin, and so much for other leaders that there might be in other countries. Turkey's creating a little bit of a problem, I read uh, uh, this morning in the newspaper. So much for them. Everything got a start in Jesus. The third word is sustain. He was therefore, he was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. This pre-existent God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit sustains us. He makes sense of bad things happening to good people. And he makes sense equally of good things that happen to bad people. Both of them a little bit strange and hard for us to find and to wind our way through at times. 
for absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us, uh, Romans 8, 39. As that is true for us personally, so it is true for us corporately as a community of hope and compassion. See, start, sustain, and the fourth word is supreme, supreme. He was supreme in the beginning and Leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there towering far above everything, everyone. Now, Paul puts this upstart Roman Caesar and uh, the gods of Greek mythology as well, squarely back in their place. For it is, a king, it is King Jesus who will have first place in everything. And in the long run, if not in the short run, as we note in our story and narrative of life, in the long run, he will lead the parade. The fifth word is spacious, spacious, so spacious is he. I love Peterson's, Peterson's paraphrase of this particular verse, um, well, this particular text, in fact, of so many things that he paraphrases in the message, but anyway, spacious. So spacious is he, so roomy that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Wow, that's, that's simply amazing. It's a total grace gift. It's, it, there's room in God's kingdom for everybody, even people like you and me, and particularly even people that aren't like you and me. There's room in God's kingdom for every, everybody. What a beautiful image here, spacious, roomy, without crowding. There's room for all of us to be the person that God has designed and is designing us to be, each of us, who his spirit is shaping each of us to be, women and men, older and younger, contemplatives and activists, prayers and doers. There's room for all of us. And in Paul's historic, uh, historical context, there were room for slaves and free, for Jews and, and Gentiles, for Roman oppressors and Greek cultists, as there is Today, and you can imagine the 21st century counterparts of those people. And so we come to the sixth word, shalom, shalom. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. There it is. There's the good news. There is the good news of Jesus. Here is shalom, not only peace, but well-being, harmony and wholeness, completeness, tranquility, safety, security. Here is the Christian salvation story, reconciliation between the creator and the oddly shaped elements of the creation, between God and equally oddly shaped and messy human beings. Here is love. We proclaim Christ crucified. And there is no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friend. What an image. What an image. So, today, uh, as when this congregation began, and when each of its parent congregations began as well, the call of God comes, a call so neatly framed in the Gospels and richly paraphrased by Peterson. Love the Lord your God with all your passion and your prayer and your muscle and your intelligence, and love your neighbor as you do yourself. Love God and love people. For as Jesus said, we'll be recognized as his followers um, by love, not by a system or a structure or a name or a title, but by love, love, thus becoming truly a community of hope and compassion. As I said, um, we are going to play a little bit also in some of the um, practices or if you like the DNA of churches of Christ and it would be my uh, suggestion uh, that those words in Colossians are foundational uh, in the narrative of churches of Christ the collective of communities of hope and compassion that Northern Community Church is in covenant with through churches of Christ and within churches of Christ in Victoria and Tasmania. So I'm going to take a moment or two or three uh, to affirm or for uh, the deeper story uh, of Churches of Christ as I perceive it to be and our desire to manifest a simple, uncluttered Christianity, the beauty of the Jesus way, if you like, thinking of beauty, the beauty of the Jesus way uh, with some of the echoes you will hear oddly, but maybe not so oddly, that we've just been focusing on in uh, Colossians chapter 1. We, first of all, are a people of the text. 
a people of the text. One of the popular slogans of our movement uh, back in the olden days and is still around, of course, is where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where the Bible is silent, we are silent. We are not a people of a system, but we're a people of the book. It behoves us to read it and to internalize it and to grapple with it and to argue with it. We're a people of the text. We also have an invitational culture. We've experienced that today. This deep story incorporates endless stories of inviting people into a relationship with God to the Father, Son and Spirit through Jesus Christ. Inviting people to be baptized by immersion as believers. Inviting people to break bread together, to participate in the Lord's Supper. And it's an open table. You didn't have to come up the front or to show to somebody as they walked by to serve you a token that gave you permission. It's an open table for all those who love the Lord Jesus. You are invited to break bread together. For all those of you who are working out what it means to follow Jesus, you're invited. It's an open. We invite people also into a relationship with all other like-minded and like-spirited Jesus followers around the corner and around the world. We invite all people, women and men, younger and older, to receive the gifts and the fruit and the passion of the Holy Spirit, releasing all of people, all people, into life and world-changing ministry and mission. So we are a people of the text, we have an invitational culture, and we are an inclusive movement. This has always been part of our deeper story too. We, we're inclusive. We're generous. We uh, excel in our generosity. How many meals was it? How many? In a 16, we're generous. We're hospitable. We include people. We serve people. We care for people. Uh, we always seek to be a bigger body, practicing hospitality and offering shelter, making room for everybody. And we celebrate the unity of all Christian believers around the New Testament and under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, a simple and an uncluttered Christianity that everybody can understand and interact with and participate in, a unity in variety. A unity in in variety. Oh, we used to say a unity in diversity, but I like the word variety a little. Unity in variety. And we, we also, um, people of the text, invitational culture, inclusive, we also seek to be influential in earthly and earthy kind of ways, communal and social ways. We seek to be influential, not from a position of power or of... Um, a sense that we have the right always um, to operate in a certain way from that position of power, but rather from the position of loving and sacrificial service, offering hope and compassion as a sign, witness and foretaste of the kingdom, for the kingdom begins now. And we are a part of announcing the kingdom and observing where the kingdom is already at work in the world uh, as we bump into the kingdom as and as the king bumps into us in all kinds of surprising ways uh, in the world in which... And of course, uh, we have a strong Christology. Uh, we have a strong view of Jesus, a high view of Jesus. Woven into the story of the early church in, in the New Testament, as it's described there, uh, but also in, the, in churches of Christ since its beginning in the 19th century, is a very clear and strong Christology. Uh, Paul's teaching in Colossians is just one of the places in the letters that he writes where he's so firm and clear in describing the beauty of Jesus, this special revelation, this amazing, miraculous manifestation of God putting on human clothes. Um, and, and of course, we, we're, we're not known as a church that has a particular system by the name that we have. We're called churches of Christ. And so again, just in the very name that we have, whether that's always in our title or in our, um, uh, the name of our church or not, that's who we are. And we stick with that rather than with no offense made, no, meant to be given uh, to those who might name themselves after a famous reformer um, or a, a mode of baptism or a method of operating together, uh, to think of um, Lutherans and Baptists and Methodists just in that um, short snapshot. Again, not making a comment, but acknowledging that we seek to be firm in standing on the simple things of calling ourselves simply churches of Christ. And repeating something that some of you may have heard in one way or another, but say, uh, heard me say this one way or another some other time uh, on an earlier occasion, wired into the current cultural 
conundrum and challenge for people who are seeking to work out what it means to follow Jesus in these crazy days of the 21st century. Um, the issue of Jesus of Nazareth rises consistently uh, in the middle of that debate uh, of Christology, of, of Jesus Christ. It anchors us, uh, us in the text. Um, we're faced with an ever-increasing complexity that is our multi-faith and multicultural world, which we love and welcome. But in the midst of that, our Christian beliefs and values and virtues are regularly marginalized, maligned, and at times mocked. And we must not allow our Christology to be diminished. We proclaim Christ crucified. Our careful naming of where God is at work in the world is best based on the uniqueness of Christ. And his crucial, um, it's almost a pun to use that word, the, his, cru- the, his crucial centrality to the Christian salvation story. We cannot be satisfied to perform acts of service and compassion and justice or to name them as God at work in the world without the words that explain from where and from whom the capacity to do these acts emerges. Equally, we cannot be satisfied to celebrate creation's beauty, as I did with those slides earlier, without words that acknowledge the the gospel teaching of the co-creator role of Jesus. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. John 1, 3. So that's a little wander in the playground of Churches of Christ. PC sees it. With just a few words, there's so much more. David, you sat in on a session we did a few weeks ago. Yes, and that was just the beginning of an eight, oh, some series on, online, wasn't it? About churches of Christ. Yes, how long are you? No, I won't ask how long that'll take you. Uh, it's, there's so much of the backstory of our, of our history, but that's just some snapshots in the playground of churches. Of so, as all people, all people, are called into a a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit uh, in ways that enable us to live above the dominant culture's enticements of human achievement and glory. And as we are all called to be little Christs and an order of local missionaries, can I simply invite you to consider or to reconsider your relationship with this loving, generous and spacious God. To review how you are responding to God's grace and mercy and hope and to commit or to recommit uh, to work on knowing him and on knowing Jesus, the one who lived and died and rose again for all people. Choosing then and there in the neighborhood to live such a transformed and full life modeled on the life of the Master Jesus that because of your loving and humble service of others and based on generosity and justice and transparent integrity and showing the way of Jesus with love and grace, others also will get to know about and Jesus too. And through that knowledge, they'll also begin to experience life in the Spirit now as well as some promised hope for life forever. But now, which is what most people are actually looking for in these days. And so, as we leave today, I think we've got some questions. Hello? That's all right. There we go. As we leave today, ascending. Ascending. Not ascending, but this is sending. Emerging from the text in Colossians 1 and our vocation or our call as a movement, as a community of hope and compassion and as an order of local missionaries that is displaying the beauty of Jesus, following his way, the way of love, the way of the cross, in other words, to be little Christs, can I invite you to take a minute or two or three to consider these questions? You've received a card. Uh, And it may well be most appropriate for you to reflect on one or other of these questions or something else that has happened or been said today in our time of gathering. But these questions are so, so important. What step can you take to better focus on Jesus? To know him and to love him. To know him better and to love him. What step could you take? Secondly, what step... Can you take to better live out his way of love in your neighborhood where you live and buy and shop and play? Thirdly, who, a person, a family, can you take a step towards? Just give you a few moments just to reflect on that and you may uh, like to make a note of that on the response.